Well, we'll get. Let's see. We'll get started this afternoon. I want to thank you for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Castelny, CEO of Preservation Virginia, and it's my honor um, to introduce today's program and our on Virginia's most endangered historic places. Uh, this afternoon, we are delighted to be joined by Kendra Parson, Labisha Allen Robbins, Daniel Davis, and Mary Coit. Um, our board chair, Jenny Keller, will moderate. And in just a moment, I'll introduce Sonia Ingram, who will say a little bit more about our Virginia's most endangered list and also introduce our speakers today. Um, I wanted to begin by adding a little perspective. Listing of uh, endangered sites is a widely employed tool um, that state and local historic preservation groups use across the country. The National Trusts, uh, America's 11 most, debuted in the late 1980s. And in, in 2000, the Preservation Alliance of Virginia announced the first of the Virginia lists, which included Mainland Farm, in Williamsburg, the Ebony Club in Roanoke, Historic Village of Auburn and Idlewood, among others. Since that, um, over that 21 year period, 160 places have been listed in Virginia and more than half have been saved and about 30% are still in the process of resolving those threats. As APVA and the Alliance combined in 2004, Preservation Virginia embraced the most endangered his, historic places list as not only an opportunity to raise awareness of solutions, but also as a way to build capacity across the state to shift communities thinking about preserving and adapting historic places um, and ensuring that they're part of the discussion as they met the evolving needs of their communities. It also has the byproduct of creating an ever expanding network of people who employ the tools and arguments uh, for why preservation is important in their communities. The most endangered list gives these communities a statewide platform to say that these places are valued, not just locally, but on a statewide level. The listings link those who are working to save these places with others who have resolved similar problems. And it's helped to give them critical information they need to talk to decision makers and others to find those solutions. Some of the listings require greater engagement and many are for multiple years. Fort Monroe appeared on the 2007 listing as the military installation was set to transfer its property to the Commonwealth. It was a multi-year effort involving local, state, and national groups um, that had at its heart to ensure that the complex and multifaceted issues to save this historic fort and its environs would reflect also the complicated history from the Old Point Comfort to the arrival of First Africans to the self-emancipated men, women, and children that made the site freedom's fortress. Um, it went, that particular site went on to be listed on America's 11 most, and today we're seeing, we see the results of that concerted effort as there is the collaboration of, uh, at the, the site of the Fort Monroe Authority and the Fort Monroe National Monument. The listing of uh, James River resulted in a seven year and counting advocacy effort with national, regional, statewide, and local groups advocating for the protection of this indigenous cultural landscape. To date, this effort has helped define preservation law. In 2019, an appeal court clarified section 110F under the National Historic Preservation Act, resulting in a broader definition of what a direct effect on a national historic landmark means. The listing of African American historic cemeteries helped sound the alarm bell to the threats that these most sacred sites face. It resulted in state legislation that now provides funding 
and in this year's General Assembly, the establishment of a position at the Department of Historic Resources to help grow capacity and responsiveness. The listing of African American schools motivated our survey to find and document the nearly 380 Rosenwald schools that were a result of the inspired collaboration between Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald and the network that's been built statewide that shares stories of solutions. I could go on. We had the listing of the tobacco barns, um, Shaka Bottom, the uh, threats to historic sites and structures by recurrent flooding. Each of these has helped Preservation Virginia engage in statewide efforts and to raise awareness of these resources and the solutions that will ensure their preservation. Preservation Virginia views the annual endangered list as an opportunity to strengthen community efforts. So we're so happy to have so many of you with us to hear the stories of this year's list and to think ahead. This year's list is no, more, no less dynamic uh, from the 20th century postmodern business park in Reston to green book sites that embody the legacy of Jim Crow laws and civil rights struggles. Uh, the human made fortified island of Fort Bull has particular um, issues and solutions that are relevant in today's world. And so today's F, uh, webinar will share some of those listings, but then also focus on the complex history of two Civil War battlefields that reflect the engagement of the U.S. colored troops uh, at these sites. I encourage you to learn more about these listings and past listings on our website. Um, and before we begin our programming, I just wanted to, to remind you of a few housekeeping tips um, that we're all familiar with now. We have a limited time and really gifted speakers today. So we will be responding to questions at the end. Um, you can put those questions in the Q&A box. And we're recording this program um, and we'll share it on our website in uh, a few days. So please, when it's posted, share it with your friends and um, colleagues. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Sonia Ingram, Preservation Field Manager for Preservation Virginia. She established our field preservation program 12 years ago. Sonia is based in Danville, but her work takes her across the state to work with communities to confront the, the threats and find solutions. She's been the organizer of our rich series of web-based programming during the pandemic. So I hope you will give a virtual applause to this talented member of Preservation Virginia's team. Sonia? Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, so today's webinar, we will start with Kendra Parson. Kendra is a field officer with the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Washington, D.C., where she has worked since 2018. In this role, she manages and supports the organization's long-term preservation campaigns and provides direct technical assistance to the preservation community to advance the protection of significant historic places around the country. She's also in her third year supporting America's 11 Most Endangered Historic Places program. Kendra holds a Master of Fine Arts in Historic Preservation from the Savannah College of Art and Design. <laughs> so um, thank you so much and welcome Kendra to talk a, a bit about the National Trust's 11 Most Endangered. Thank you so much, Sonia. I'll go ahead and share my screen, hopefully successfully. All right, well, as Sonia said, my name is Kendra Parson and I'm a field officer with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I'm so pleased to be with you all today to share a little bit of information about our uh, 11 Most Endangered Historic Places program. Um, and throughout the presentation, you'll also see photos of the sites that were included on our 2020 list of most endangered places. We have not yet announced 
the 2021 list or I would share those with you as well. So um, the National Trust's Most Endangered list is an annual list uh, that spotlights important historic resources nationwide that are at risk of destruction or irreparable damage. The list has been running since 1988. Um, we've listed over 300 places in that time, and we're very proud to say that fewer than 5% of the listed sites have been lost. The 11 Most Endangered List uh, is a highly effective advocacy tool that catalyzes high-profile preservation wins. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to collaborate with partners to strengthen and support the National Preservation Network, and we are uh, very happy to have had uh, several past listings where we could collaborate with Preservation Virginia in particular, including uh, Rasawek in Covina County, which we listed last year. It also gives us the opportunity to tell the full story of our nation's history by highlighting sites that are related to diverse stories and themes. So, um, that includes African American history, women's history, Native American history, Asian American history, uh, Latinx history, public lands, and many more. Oops, sorry, technical difficulty. So, um, how do we choose? what sites go on the 11 most endangered list. Uh, it's primarily through an application process. And so we love to have suggestions from people across the country about what they'd like to see included on the list. Um, what we look for in those applications, firstly, is a compelling history. We don't, it doesn't necessarily need to be listed on the National Register or be considered eligible for any other sort of historic designation. Um, but, a but we look for places that um, will have, uh, where, whose history has resonance um, broadly. We also are looking for places where it has an imminent, that have an imminent threat. So um, the 11, 11 most and other most endangered lists are most effective when the threat is tangible, uh, but not also not so far gone where there's no hope of saving the place. Um, we look for places where we can promote potential solutions. So for example, if there's a historic site that is threatened by uh, construction, new construction, um, can we suggest an alternative location for the new construction that will spare the historic site? We look for a geographic and thematic diversity. So uh, as a national organization, we're hope we like to have our uh, 11 most endangered list represent uh, places across the, uh, across the nation. Um, we do tend to get a lot, a lot of nominations from the Northeast. Uh, but we can't have everything concentrated there. So um, looking especially for sites in the Western part of the country so that we really get at uh, our nation's full history. Um, and we look for thematic diversity. So in the past, we've listed uh, not only historic buildings, but also historic districts. Uh, we even had a, a boat on the, on the most endangered places list one year. Um, so a variety of sites uh, as well. And finally, we look for places that uh, we think can grab the attention of the media. And I think, um, I know that this can sound a bit cynical, uh, you know, that we, that media potential is part of our, of our uh, considerations, but it really is most effective if for, as a listing on the uh, most endangered list, if sites can grab that media attention because it creates the pressure that will uh, compel a change in their situation. Some challenges of forming the 11 most list, number one, I think is that this is an enormous list for our staff and I'm sure Preservation Virginia agrees that these lists take a lot of staff time and investment. Um, you know, I, we uh, typically accept applications at the beginning of the year, but then don't announce until May or June. And I know that that seems like a long time, but there's so much work that happens behind the scenes to put one of these lists together and to prepare to, to push out the announcement. Um, so another another big challenge is timing. We uh, it you know I think often because we are looking at places that are imminently threatened, there is a question of is this place going to make it until the announcement? Uh, and sometimes that can be a bit of a nail biter. But we you know there so it's important to find a place find places where we can make a big difference by by staving off an imminent threat. 
but at the same time, uh, it's not very effective if the if, you know we end up selecting a place and then unfortunately find that that place has been demolished like you know it's a week before the announcement. So that's something that we're always trying to balance. Um, and then another big challenge is that the response to uh, most endangered list is very dependent on the media environment. So. Last year, we ended up pushing the announcement of our list from May to September because of the pandemic, which uh, was an interesting media environment in and of itself. Everything went virtual um, and that was a challenge. Uh, and then also because we did move the list announcement to the fall, uh, we were contending with the lead up to the presidential election. So it was an especially difficult year to grab attention for the announcement. Um, I, in the end, we were, I think we were very happy with how that went and because we did put so much time and effort into making sure that it made a splash regardless of all the other uh, more headline grabbing things that were going on at the time. So I'd like to share uh, our, our 2020 uh, 11 month list. As I said, we haven't announced 2021 yet. So unfortunately I can't share that one. Um, but if you take a look at all of the places represented in this list, you'll see uh, a variety of geographic areas. We have um, a couple of Native American sites, several sites associated with African-American history, um, women's history, uh, Latinx history, and so we were really, really pleased with the diversity of sites that we received nominations for last year and that we were able to highlight uh, such a, a rich variety of places in our list. I won't read it to you, um, but if you're interested in learning more about any of these sites, uh, they're all available uh, via our website, savingplaces.org. Unfortunately, uh, earlier this year, we had our rare casualty from our 11 most list. So last year, we listed the Sun and Sand Motor Hotel in Jackson, Mississippi, which is a mid-century modern hotel. It was a gathering place for Mississippi legislators and civil rights activists um, after its, its opening in, 19, in the 1960s. And it was unfortunately uh, mostly demolished earlier this year to make way for a surface parking lot, um, which is never an outcome that we like to hear as preservationists. But you know, we fought the good fight for this place um, in collaboration with the Mississippi Heritage Trust. And unfortunately, you know, it, it is the case that when you're fighting for an imminently endangered place, that sometimes you don't win. Um, but I'm glad that we were able to to make that effort anyway. Uh, on the bright side, although we're still relatively early in the process for many of our sites that were included in last year's listing, we have had some indications of advocacy success. So uh, one of our sites was the uh, Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ in Chicago, which was the uh, church where Emmett Till's funeral took place. Um, it's now being, or rather I should say first, it is uh, threatened by um, needed maintenance issues and serious structural problems, um, but it's now being considered as a new national historic site honoring Emmett and Mamie Till, which is great news. Uh, the National Trust has also been working with the congregation to do a structural engineering assessment. Um, in Excelsior Springs, Missouri, uh, the city of Excelsior Springs is now working on developing an RFP for the Hall of Waters. The Hall of Waters is an enormous mineral spa building constructed by the Public Works um, as, as already during, uh, excuse me, I'm not being too super eloquent today, during the Great Depression. Um, and uh, it's in use as city offices, but it needs a lot of rehabilitation work. So. Um, the city has now committed to undertaking some of that work and has also heard from potential investors. Um, and then uh, finally in, in Columbia, Virginia, uh, the James River Water Authority will more closely study a potential alternative site for a project that is currently slated to be built on the land that was home to Rasawek, the historic capital of the Monacan Indian nation. Um, and we're very glad to continue to advocate on behalf of that site with Preservation Virginia. So um, our 2021 list will be announced June 3rd, um, and we uh, really look forward to sharing that list with all of you. Um, you can follow us on our website at savingplaces.org or on social media to be among the first to hear about uh, what's included on this year's list. And we hope that uh, those of you who are, are with us today will join us on behalf of advocating for this new list of sites.
Thank you very much. And um, I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Sonia. Great. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, so now I am going to uh, give a short presentation on Preservation Virginia's Most Endangered Historic Preservation List. And uh, Elizabeth has already shared some of this, but I do have some images as well. All right. Um, Elizabeth uh, has already mentioned some of this, like I said, uh, but Preservation Virginia's, Virginia's Most Endangered Historic Places list started in 2000 by the Preservation Alliance of Virginia, and it did become Preservation Virginia's program after a merger in 2004. It is a way to ra raise awareness of places of vulnerable due to neglect, insufficient funds, inappropriate development, and insensitive public policies. And it's never been a way, meant, it's never been meant to shame owners, but to raise awareness, assist with finding preservation solutions, as Kendra mentioned, and to provide a preservation tool for the nominator and the locality, and also to provide Preservation Virginia with a baseline of sites in which to focus. Again, uh, Elizabeth mentioned this, we have 160 places across Virginia on our list. Most of these are individual places, but we do have some thematic statewide listings, such as the Rosenwald schools and cemeteries and metal trust bridges. The list includes buildings, uh, as you might expect, houses, churches, schools, forts, um, also structures such as canals and bridges, cemeteries, archeological sites, roads, battlefields, we have landscapes and scenic view sheds, farms, parks, historic districts, and in a few cases, entire communities and towns. This is, uh, I wanted to point out, if you go to our website, we have a story map of uh, Virginia's most endangered historic places. The story map has a, this is the map. So you can uh, go to this map, and zoom in on each of the individual icons and find out more information about each one. Um, and there's also images here um, and the, the link is at the bottom there. I think we can probably share that in the chat as well. And these are just a few of the places from the past. Um, last year, Rasawek, which did become one of the National Trusts 11 Most Endangered, African American Cemeteries, um, the James River View Shed, Historic Courthouses and Courthouse Squares, Shaco Bottom, Cultural Resources Threatened by Utility Infrastructure Projects, Tobacco Barns. But again, um, please go to our website and take a look at the, the story map and you can find out a lot more information about these. So this year we had more nominations than we have ever had. Um, we had our announcement last week and we have 10 places on the list this year. This is the list of those places. Um, again, if you go to our website, you can find out more information about these. And I'm just gonna very, very, very briefly go over them. Association Drive Historic District in Fairfax County. Um, this is a, a group of modernist buildings that are threatened by a, a transportation uh, project. Civil War battlefields in which United States Colored Troops fought. And this focuses on two battlefields. One is the Battle of St. Mary's Samaria Church and the other one is the Battle of New Market Heights. And we'll hear more about that. The Connor House in Manassas Park. Fort Wool in Hampton, Green Book Sites statewide, the Justice House, Turkey Run in Chesterfield County, the Mount Calvary Cemetery Complex in Portsmouth, the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Gainesville. This was a church that was damaged by arson a few years ago. 
River Farm in Alexandria, and the Shaco Hill African Burial Ground in Richmond. This is the second burial ground for African Americans in Richmond. It was heavily damaged in the past, but it's currently um, threatened by upcoming transportation department um, projects. We also do a look back on previous listings at times, and we did that this year because we had several nominations for historic schools. So as a way to sort of highlight those schools, we, um, we did a look back on previous listings, and, and those are the Mary E. Branch Community Center, Old Dawn School, and the Ralph Bunch School. Um, so a few years ago, we looked at our list and we, we, we did a, a little survey of the list and we determined that 50, of the 160 places, 54% have been saved, 29% are still endangered, and 17% have been lost. We also looked at what are the biggest threats to these places and um, development pressure is the biggest threat followed by demo demolition by neglect and infrastructure projects comes in third. And how these sites were saved and, and by far the most common way that sites have been saved on our list is from community really grassroots efforts and these strong local organizations. So we do plan to take another look at our list and examine those places again. We definitely have seen benefits through the list and, and some of this is through increased awareness and some of the places have been able to use the listing to get grants. Um, some of those examples are historic cemeteries and some of the listings also, we have seen new legislative protections come out of this is uh, for example, historic cemeteries. Two of our listings have become special projects at Preservation Virginia, Rosenwald Schools and Tobacco Barns. And again, uh, as we've mentioned previously, several of the places on our list have went on to receive national recognition through the National Trust by being on the National Trust in 11 most endangered. So um, that's all the slides that I have, but you know, I think like Kendra mentioned, there are some challenges to this program. And so one of the biggest challenges that, that I feel that we have is we have a small staff and the, you know, we want to help out every place as much as possible. And that can be a challenge and Kendra can probably um, back me up on that. Um, you know, we want to continue to work with these places, all 160 places as much as we can. But that can be a challenge. We, we still will continue this program. We may have some changes in the future, but um, we do think it's a successful program. So that's it. Okay. So now we are going to um, switch up a little bit on the webinar and we're gonna turn it over and focus on one of the places on Preservation Virginia's most endangered list this year. And that is Civil War battlefields in, in which United States colored troops fought. Um, specifically two, two of these battlefields were nominated this year, St. Mary's Samaria Church in Charles City County and the New Market Heights battlefield in Henrico County. Both of these are very important Civil War battlefields in Virginia that had USCT involvement. And they're threatened for different reasons. Um, a proposed landfill expansion, development uh, threats. But one of the biggest threats to these battlefields is really um, the lack of awareness and education on the importance of the contributions and the stories of the, the USCT. And really that has, uh, sort of been excluded from the traditional Civil War narrative. So we really uh, ho are hoping that this um, listing will help raise awareness on that. So I am now going to turn it over to Daniel Davis. Daniel Davis is a graduate of Longwood University with a bachelor's degree in public history. He has worked as a ranger and a historian at the Appomattox Courthouse National Historic Site 
and in Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. He's the author or co-author of numerous books on the Civil War. His work can be found in Emerging Civil War Stories, Blue and Gray Magazine, Civil War Times, Hallowed Ground, and on the website EmergingCivilWar.com. He currently resides in Fredericksburg. So um, uh, go ahead, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, very excited to be here this afternoon uh, to talk about this. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Now, on January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed into law the Emancipation Proclamation. The proclamation uh, not only guaranteed freedom, abolished slavery in the states then in rebellion against uh, against the United States, but it also authorized the recruitment of Blacks and African Americans into federal service, albeit at that time, a number of states had already raised or would raise uh, regiments to serve in the Union Army. And roughly 179,000 African American soldiers would serve in the U.S. Army. Another 19 to 20,000 would serve in the United States Navy. And as Lincoln would later put it at Gettysburg, roughly about 36,000 of those men would give the last full measure of devotion. But because these units were uh, raised relatively late in the war and did not take the field until the latter part of the conflict, late 1862 and into 1864, uh, there, and for a number of other reasons, uh, there, uh, there are not that many USCT battlefields, unfortunately, out there. What you see here on the map is roughly about 40 sites that have some type of USCT footprint, whether they experienced direct combat, they were in combat support, or it, there was an encampment. These are sites are on the Civil War Sites Advisory Commission. But at the same time, there's roughly 15 or so uh, sites related to African Americans in the Civil War and United States color troops that are not on the Civil War Sites Advisory uh, Commission's list. Uh, many of these sites are already fairly well known. Uh, Fort Wagner, for instance, because of the 54th Massachusetts in the film Glory, uh, Port Hudson during the Vicksburg campaign, Petersburg, uh, the, the fighting at the crater, New Market Heights, which we'll talk a little bit more about later on, as well as Fort Blakely. Some of these other sites are not as well known uh, that you see there on uh, the list. And unfortunately, uh, some of these sites have been uh, lost to time, lost to history, lost to development, such as Fort Henderson in Athens, Alabama, and much of the Nashville uh, battlefield in Tennessee. Many of these sites on the map that I showed you are state sites, uh, such as Isla Mound, Fort Pillow, Fort Blakely. Uh, there are also parts, uh, uh, units of the National Park Service, such as Appomattox Courthouse, the crater at Petersburg. Some of them are in private hands, such as uh, the remnants of Fort Henderson. And when we lose one of these battlefields, we lose a collective part of our American story because these hallowed ground, this hallowed ground, these battlefields are the last tangible connection that we have to those men who fought there. And the United States Colored Troops in particular and the African-Americans who serve in the United States Army, United States Navy, they have a unique story to tell because, because of the Emancipation Proclamation they were not only fighting for their own freedom, but for the freedom of untold thousands. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Sonia. Great, thanks, Dan. So our next speaker, Lavisha, um, she it was not able to attend today, but she has sent us a pre-recorded video that I'm going to show. Um, Lavisha Allen Rollins, she is from Charles City County, Virginia, where she has lived until her junior year of college. After returning to Charles City County, she began researching the pollutants that were being released into her community from the nearby power plants. And this compelled Lavisha and others to organize C5, the Concerned Citizens of Charles City County, which is an organization formed to prevent harm and ensure her community is protected and not overlooked. Lavisha's goals with C5 are to develop a program to research existing energy generations, provide water and air quality, and look to provide other forms of energy development in her region. 
She attended VCU and Hampton University, and she has a master in architecture. So I am now going to share my screen and show Lavisha's short video. Sonia, there's no sound. Okay, hang on for one second. Can you hear this now? No, still no sound. All right, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna um, hold off on that then and we will go to the next and I have to see what the problem is because that's the important part. So, um, so I am going to actually turn it back to Dan now and Dan is gonna speak um, just a little bit more about um, St. Mary's Samaria Church. And uh, so go ahead, Dan. Give me just one moment. All right, very good. Now, the first battlefield we're going to talk about is St. Mary's Church, Samaria Church, or Nance's Shop, depending on which account you look at and which uh, book you read. Uh, Stale made it in front of uh, Cold Harbor in June of 1864. Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant decided to disengage with Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, move south, and attack the Confederate Logistical Center at Petersburg. And in doing so, Grant sent Major General Phillips Sher Sheridan, the individual that you see on the screen, with two divisions of cavalry into central Virginia to wreak havoc on the Virginia Central Railroad. Uh, Sheridan, in fact, would be turned back in a two-day engagement at Trevilian Station in Louisa County. And through the course of uh, the month of June, uh, much of the middle to latter part of June, uh, his cavalry rode uh, through central Virginia, uh, angling to the southeast to rejoin Grant then at Petersburg. Now, when Grant moved from Cold Harbor uh, to across the James and to Petersburg, he shifted his base of supplies from White House Landing on the Pamunkey River to City Point on the James. And Sheridan's going to arrive at White House Landing on uh, the afternoon of uh, June uh, the 20th. He's going to cross the Pamunkey the following day. Now, at that time, White House was in the process of being uh, dismantled and destroyed as the Union uh, troops moved on toward Petersburg. Uh, there was a garrison there, a mixed unit of um, white uh, troops, from uh, uh, various cavalry, artillery, and uh, infantry regiments under the command of a fellow named uh, George Getty. But also in Getty's command was roughly over 300 men of the 28th United States Colored Troops who ultimately joined Sheridan's cavalry and continued the march uh, south toward the James. They crossed the Chickahominy at Jones's Bridge on June 22nd, and then the following day, uh, in the area around Samaria Church, Nance's shop, uh, Union Cavalry from the 6th New York Cavalry, will be surprised by Brigadier General John Chambliss's 
uh, Confederate uh, cavalry somewhere in this uh, vicinity. The best account we have is from Richard Beale of the 9th Virginia Cavalry, who said that the attack began near a sawmill at Nance's shop. Six New York Cavalry would be uh, pushed back, and Getty would actually offer to their brigade commander, Thomas Devon, uh, the 28th United States Colored Troops to join the fight and help press back the Confederates. The 28th uh, ultimately shakes out a battle line. They're joined by uh, several other white cavalry regiments. They launch a counterattack in what uh, the historian of the 6th New York Cavalry said was a very fierce engagement, push the Confederates back and reestablish their picket lines. Uh, the following day, the 28th would uh, continue its march through to Charles City Courthouse, ultimately crossing the James and going into uh, camp across from Fort Powhatan on the James River on June the 25th. Several months later, during the siege of Petersburg, the Sess Grant, which you see there on the left, is going to launch operations late in September. Part of these operations are, is going to be directed against the Confederate capital at Richmond. Grant is hoping that an attack north of the James at Richmond will uh, compel Robert E. Lee to shift troops, weaken his lines around Petersburg so that Grant can then exploit that weakness. That movement north of the James is going to be under, under the direction of Major General Benjamin Butler and the Army of the James. Among uh, the Army of the James are a number of United States uh, colored troops. Uh, for our purposes, uh, we're going to focus on eight in particular uh, regiments of the United States colored troops who will take play a part in the battle at New Market Heights on very early on the morning of September the 29th. 1864, where you see the Confederate battle line, uh, the 3rd Arkansas, the 5th Texas, 4th Texas, that is modern Route 5 and just east of the Route 5 intersection with 295. As I mentioned, uh, roughly eight or relatively eight uh, United States Colored Troop regiments will take part in the storming of New Market Heights. The initial attack, which goes forward at about 5 a.m., uh, is going to be repulsed. Undeterred, uh, the regiments push forward, ultimately breaking through the Confederate position with the Confederates withdrawing uh, to the west to uh, another position, fortified position at Fort Harrison, um, which is part of the Richmond defenses. New Market Heights is an incredibly fascinating story, uh, mainly because there will be 14 medals of honor awarded for valor and gallantry in action to members of the United States Colored Troops who fought there. 25 total Medals of Honor were awarded to Black soldiers and Black sailors during the American Civil War. 14 of those are at New Market Heights. Among them, uh, among the recipients is Sergeant or Major Christian Fleetwood of the 4th United States Colored Troops, who you can see there uh, in the photograph, standing second from left, you will notice that he is wearing his newly awarded Medal of Honor. Uh, during the fighting, uh, he watched two color bearers from his regiment be shot down by the Confederates. He picked up the colors of the 4th United States Colored Troops and carried them throughout the battle. And the remnants of that flag are now uh, under the protection of the Maryland Historical Society. Uh, another individual who will receive the Medal of Honor there uh, and will uh, later go on to be a rather famous Shakespearean actor is Powhatan Beatty. Uh, Beatty, you can see, is uh, wearing his Medal of Honor there in this uh, photograph. Uh, when all of the other officers of his company uh, were shot down, uh, Beatty took command of uh, his company and continued to lead them throughout the battle. And from that, uh, from those actions, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back over to Sonia. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna try this again. Let's see here. Hello, my name is Lagisha Rollins with Concerned Citizens of Charlotte City County, also known as C5. Recently, there was a request placed for an expansion to our existing landfill. With the expansion, there was a cultural study done 
with the landfill that exposed a potential battlefield that is located where the landfill currently sits. The battlefield that we're referencing is referred to as Nancy's Shop or the Battle of St. Mary's Samaria Church. The battle that took place at Nancy's Shop, St. Mary's or Samaria Church was a battle that was held between the Union and Confederate soldiers and also the USCT. During our research of this battle, we were able to find in many of the records found in the War of the Records that shows the USCT was involved in the battle that took place at Nancy's shop. With the landfill expansion possibly endangering this site, C5 and Preservation Virginia want to make sure that the cultural study that is done is done thoroughly to ensure that we find out more information about the battle that took place at Nancy's shop. We found that this is a very significant part of history that we want to uncover. Number one, because not a lot is known about it. Outside of what's documented in the War of the Rebellion, we want to add additional information that we can find, possibly from this survey and archeological study, but also for more records that we're looking into currently to find out more about what happened at the Battle of Nancy's shop. We wanna also highlight the USCT that was involved in this fight, as that is a significant part of history that residents of Charles City County would love to hear more about. Being a resident formerly of Charles City County, it would be very helpful to know about history that took place regarding USCT to know that they helped with the freeing of the enslaved slaves that were in Charles City County. We hope that you will join us in helping to preserve this battlefield and learning more about the battle that took place at Nancy's shop. C5, along with Preservation Virginia, will keep you informed about what we find from the survey being done with the expansion that is being pro proposed for the Ch Charles City County uh, landfill. We again, thank you for having me on this webinar and we look forward to working with Preservation Virginia along with other organizations such as battlefield.org to get more information about what took place at Nancy's shop slash Samaria Church slash St. Mary's Church. Again, I look forward to seeing and talking with Preservation Virginia soon and thank you for having me. Um, and so lastly, we will now hear from Mary Koik. Um, Mary has spent nearly her entire professional career working toward the protection of hallowed ground associated with America's historic battlefields. She joined the American Battlefield Trust in 2005, working in grassroots advocacy, encouraging win-win solutions that balance preservation and progress in local communities and campaigning against threats, including the casinos at Gettysburg, Walmart at the Wilderness, and development proposals on Morris Island, South Carolina. Now the Director of Communications, Mary oversees Trust Public Relations and is the editor of Hallowed Ground, the award-winning membership magazine focused on military history and how those events resonate in the present. Um, welcome, Mary. My pleasure, thanks for having me. And let's hopefully we uh, have finished our uh, technical difficulties for the day. So hopefully that went through quickly. Uh, and I even removed a picture that was uh, going to had once or twice given me some problems on screen share. So I think we should we should be clear for now. Um, you know, I will not pretend to be as wonderful a historian as Dan is in terms of giving specific details or some of the other people I see here as participants um, in terms of their knowledge for some of these subjects. Uh, but what I want to speak to is, you know, the idea that history is at its heart stories. And these are profound stories that not enough people know about. You know, the idea that in the first 100 years of this nation, more than 200,000 black soldiers fought for this country is something that is not nearly known broadly enough. Um, you know, 10% of the Continental Army and of the Union armies at the end of the Civil War were made up of African Americans. And this is something that is, it should be common knowledge. Uh, just that narrative is so powerful. It's one of empowerment. These are people who are fighting for freedom, their own and in a broader sense. And that is something that is, is meaningful today as it was then. 
Um, you know, one of the things that most people have heard about some of this or have some awareness from is the movie Glory. And that's wonderful. I'm, it's a fantastic film. I hope everyone has seen it. Um, but the impact of that shouldn't be understated. But I don't think as many people remember the text at the end of that. They remember the story of that one unit and forget you know, that little um, appendix there that talks about how many black troops there were who fought and what the overall significance was. And, you know, we have to remember that that's a work of fiction. Um, that movie even, um, you know, the, the gentleman pictured here is uh, William Carney, who was the first black man um, to participate in action that resulted in him receiving a Medal of Honor. And he was in the 54th Massachusetts. Um, and yet that fictionalized story has, has characters that aren't him. Um, so there are really profound stories that aren't told to the extent that we should all remember them. And preservation plays a key role in that. Um, you know, one of the things that I live here in Washington, I think is really incredibly powerful is um, this memorial here that is in, in Washington. And not only does it have this beautiful statue and a beautiful setting, but if you go and you visit it, it actually has the names of these black soldiers and sailors who fought. Um, and it's putting them in the story uh, individually as participants. You know, battlefield preservation is a wonderful means of telling these stories because it, it lets you walk in the footsteps of those ordinary soldiers, not just the generals you might read about in your high school textbook. It is a way to actually, you know, have a tangible connection, as Dan said, to what happened 150 or you know 250 almost in some cases years ago now it lets you touch the past in a profound way um, that you know we may hopefully most of us will never experience you know being in combat ourselves but we can go to these places and we can have that experience of memory and trying to honor their their sacrifice their bravery and you know try to remember those that did give, you know, give their all in this greater cause. Um, that's something that we should all want to do to remember that. Um, you know, the, the trust has been around for almost 35 years, uh, and uh, we have, you know, worked in that time to try and, and tell these stories on the battlefield of a number of important sites related to the USCT story. Um, you know, and even some of those units, as Dan mentioned, that do predate the official founding of the USCTs. Um, you know, going back to 1993 and protecting land at Port Hudson in Louisiana. Um, you know, here's this beautiful picture of, of Morris Island, which is where um, the, that charge of the 54th Massachusetts in the movie Glory took place. Um, you know, it's, it's been eroded. The, uh, the actual, you know, shape of the island has changed pretty profoundly, but when there were development threats for what remains of that site, um, we believed it was important to protect that. That is a place that people should be able to visit and, and remember. Um, you know, the, the National Park Service, um, you know, does recognize in their official list that the Civil War Sites Advisory Commission list that folks have, have referenced today, um, you know, that number of sites in Virginia uh, specifically that are USCT related. Um, you know, we have, I will not yet say we've saved land at all of them, but we are working toward saving land when there are willing sellers available and there are properties that can be protected and safeguarded for the future so that hopefully future generations will not say that they never learned these stories, that there will be places they can go to experience them. Um, you know, I think you've probably seen this map already, the map of New Market Heights here. Um, you know, we are at 88 acres and counting of land that the trust has been able to protect at New Market Heights. Um, you know, and now with our latest acquisition, um, you know, we have enough contiguous acreage that we can start that planning process to interpret the site. Um, to date, there has not been, you know, a, a, a trail or anything you can go. There are a handful of signs. Um, you know, as Dan said, this battlefield is, is fairly fragmented. It's a pretty major road through the area. It's right near a highway interchange. Um, you know, I think a lot of people will say, in terms of understanding where troops moved, 
where these places are in relation to the Dairy Queen. Um, so there, there is some significant um, you know, loss and degradation to the property. Um, there is land that is um, owned by the county, but at this point yet, there has not previously been a chance that you can go and walk a trail and have that experience of reading some signage and trying to gain a deeper understanding on the ground. And you know, it's, it's a process that we, we hope to get there, but it's beginning. Um, and I think that is a important step to having more Virginians, more Americans hear the story of this incredible place and the incredible men who fought there. Um, you know, those 14 um, African-American men who received the Medal of Honor for actions in one day. That's you know, pretty unprecedented uh, in, the, in that period in history. It truly is. So um, I just wanted to close by, by saying this is an ongoing process the trust is engaged in. Um, and we do have um, you know, a way that if you wish to support this work, um, you know, not just individual parcel by individual parcel, we do have a, a dedicated um, project here that you can go visit battlefields.org slash fighting hyphen for hyphen, hyphen freedom. And this is our overall effort um, to protect and interpret these sites central to that you know, black military experience from the Revolutionary War through the Civil War. Um, and it's, it's important work and it's work uh, that will not be done, um, you know, in a day. It's work that is ongoing, um, but it will be ongoing because it is that important. And then back to you, Sonia. Great. Thank you so much. So, uh, wonderful information. Um, I don't know if we have any questions. Um, Jenny, Genevieve Keller is our moderator today. Um, Jenny, do you want to say anything? Do we have any questions? Uh, well, I, I haven't seen any questions in the chat. I think we've had such thorough and complete presentations this afternoon full of, of information that maybe people didn't feel a need to ask questions. Um, I, I can filibuster for a few minutes. If anyone can type really, really fast and send me a question, I can uh, get it in real, real fast. But I do want to say um, uh, hello uh, in my concluding remarks to you on behalf of the Board of Preservation Virginia. This is one of our, uh, as Elizabeth and Sonia have have told you this is one of our um, really long and enduring programs and one of our robust programs. Um, when I, we first took this up in 2000, I, I had a little fear and trepidation that this was going to be a hand wringing and what was it going to do for preservation? But I think it's really been uh, an, a really successful program in terms of bringing people together and focusing awareness on, on resources that we haven't taken the care as communities, as a commonwealth, as preservationists, as, as, as we could have. Um, and one of the real rewards of this is that occasionally, maybe more than occasionally, some of these projects that have been on the endangered list find their way to our awards list. And, and that is just a grand moment uh, to, to see people persevere, to see all that effort come together. Uh, it's also a place I think where this program brings together activists and, and advocates and scholars and professionals and bureaucrats and local, state, national officials. In the rare instances where one of our projects from Virginia has made it to the national list, we've had really successful opportunities to share with the National Trust in bringing assistance to these communities and these historic places. Um, so it's kind of ironic that out of uh, some collective problems, uh, we've, we've had some of our, our major successes. And so I wanna say thank you to everyone that has labored in this field and in this endeavor uh, for more than two, two decades now. Uh, but at the same time, I just would say as a, as a lifelong and career long preservationist, um, I'm painfully aware that some of these are of our own making because uh, for over a hundred years, Preservationists have excluded sites uh, that were modest, often in scale. Uh, slave dwellings, uh, communities of color, uh, minor main street areas, uh, agricultural resources. These are the things that we have not documented, that we have not put on the National Register, that we have not enacted local controls for. 
And, and, and I take culpability for that as, as someone who has been in this field for almost half a century now, um, even though I thought that that was one of my areas of focus to, to kind of be a reformer in this, in this profession, in this field. And, and so I'm so pleased that all of you are doing this necessary work, even though we, we could have and should have done it half a century ago. We're doing it now. We're learning as we go along. We're creating new coalitions and gaining new partners and new allies. And it really does take all of us. I'm really hopeful about new programs uh, that, that we have at, at Preservation Virginia and that I know Department of Historic Resources is going to initiate with uh, increased funding from the, from the Commonwealth. Um, so again, I say thank you for being with us today. Uh, also be sure if you haven't visited there to go to the African American Civil War Museum in Washington, DC. Uh, that has a lot about the uh, USCT, which has certainly been uh, underplayed in, in American history and such a wonderful opportunity uh, to focus attention on that today. So I will just say uh, good afternoon and we hope to see you soon and keep up the good work. Thank you to our, our panel and to our staff today. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, thank you, everyone, all of our speakers. Um, we will have, this is recorded and it'll be on our website. If anybody has questions, feel free to contact us. And thanks, everyone, for participating. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.